Chapter 9 The Work and the Life God is the source of life and light and joy to the universe. Like rays of light from the sun, like the streams of water bursting from a living spring, blessings flow out from Him to all His creatures. And wherever the life of God is in the hearts of men, it will flow out to others in love and blessing. Our Savior's joy was in the uplifting and redemption of fallen men. For this He counted not His life dear unto Himself, but endured the cross, despising the shame. So angels are ever engaged in working for the happiness of others. This is their joy. That which selfish hearts would regard as humiliating service, ministering to those who are wretched and in every way inferior in character and rank, is the work of sinless angels. The spirit of Christ's self-sacrificing love is the spirit that pervades heaven and is the very essence of its bliss. This is the spirit that Christ's followers will possess, the work that they will do. When the love of Christ is enshrined in the heart like sweet fragrance, it cannot be hidden. Its holy influence will be felt by all with whom we come in contact. The spirit of Christ in the heart is like a spring in the desert, flowing to refresh all and making those who are ready to perish eager to drink of the water of life. Love to Jesus will be manifested in a desire to work as He worked for the blessing and uplifting of humanity. It will lead to love, tenderness, and sympathy toward all the creatures of our Heavenly Father's care. The Savior's life on earth was not a life of ease and devotion to Himself, but He toiled with persistent, earnest, and untiring effort for the salvation of lost mankind. From the manger to Calvary, he followed the path of self-denial and sought not to be released from arduous tasks, painful travels, and exhausting care and labor. He said, The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew 20, verse 28. This was the one great object of his life. Everything else was secondary and subservient. It was his meat and drink to do the will of God and to finish his work. Self and self-interest had no part in his labor. So those who are the partakers of the grace of Christ will be ready to make any sacrifice that others for whom he died may share the heavenly gift. They will do all they can to make the world better for their stay in it. This spirit is the sure outgrowth of a soul truly converted. No sooner does one come to Christ than there is born in his heart a desire to make known to others what a precious friend he has found in Jesus. The saving and sanctifying truth cannot be shut up in his heart. If we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ and are filled with the joy of his indwelling spirit, we shall not be able to hold our peace. If we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, we shall have something to tell. Like Philip, when he found the Savior, we shall invite others into his presence. We shall seek to present to them the attractions of Christ and the unseen realities of the world to come. There will be an intensity of desire to follow in the path that Jesus trod. There will be an earnest longing that those around us may behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John 1, verse 29. And the effort to bless others will react in blessings upon ourselves. This was the purpose of God in giving us a part to act in the plan of redemption. He has granted men the privilege of becoming partakers of the divine nature, and in their turn of diffusing blessings to their fellow men. This is the highest honor, the greatest joy, that it is possible for God to bestow upon men. Those who thus become participants in labors of love are brought nearest to their Creator. God might have committed the message of the gospel and all the work of loving ministry to the heavenly angels. He might have employed other means for accomplishing His purpose. But in His infinite love, He chose to make us co-workers with Himself, with Christ and the angels, that we might share the blessing, the joy, the spiritual uplifting, which results from this unselfish ministry. We are brought into the sympathy with Christ through the fellowship of His sufferings. 
every act of self-sacrifice for the good of others strengthens the spirit of beneficence in the giver's heart, allying him more closely to the Redeemer of the world, who was rich, yet for our sakes became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 and it is only as we thus fulfill the divine purpose of our creation that life can be a blessing to us. If you will go to work as Christ designs that his disciples shall, and win souls for him, you will feel the need of a deeper experience and a greater knowledge in divine things, and will hunger and thirst after righteousness. You will plead with God, and your faith will be strengthened, and your soul will drink deeper drafts at the well of salvation. Encountering opposition and trials will drive you to the Bible in prayer. You will grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ, and will develop a rich experience. The spirit of unselfish labor for others gives depth, stability, and Christ-like loveliness to the character, and brings peace and happiness to its possessor. The aspirations are elevated. There is no room for sloth or selfishness. Those who thus exercise the Christian graces will grow and will become strong to work for God. They will have clear spiritual perceptions, a steady growing faith, and an increased power in prayer. The Spirit of God, moving upon their spirit, calls forth the sacred harmonies of the soul in answer to the divine touch. Those who thus devote themselves to unselfish effort for the good of others are most surely working out their own salvation. The only way to grow in grace is to be disinterestedly doing the very work which Christ has enjoined upon us, to engage to the extent of our ability in helping and blessing those who need the help we can give them. Strength comes by exercise. Activity is the very condition of life. Those who endeavor to maintain Christian life by passively accepting the blessings that come through the means of grace and doing nothing for Christ are simply trying to live by eating without working. And in the spiritual, as in the natural world, this always results in degeneration and decay. A man who would refuse to exercise his limbs would soon lose all power to use them. Thus the Christian, who will not exercise his God-given powers, not only fails to grow up into Christ, but he loses the strength that he already had. The Church of Christ is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. Its mission is to carry the gospel to the world, and the obligation rests upon all Christians. Everyone, to the extent of their talent and opportunity, is to fulfill the Savior's commission. The love of Christ revealed to us makes us debtors to all who know him not. God has given us light, not for ourselves alone, but to shed upon them. If the followers of Christ were awake to duty, there would be thousands where there is one today proclaiming the gospel in heathen lands, and all who could not personally engage in the work would yet sustain it with their means, their sympathy, and their prayers— and there would be far more earnest labor for souls in Christian countries. We need not go to heathen lands or even leave the narrow circle of the home if it is there that our duty lies in order to work for Christ. We can do this in the home circle, in the church, among those with whom we associate and with whom we do business. The greater part of our Savior's life on earth was spent in patient toil in the carpenter's shop at Nazareth, Ministering angels attended the Lord of life as he walked side by side with peasants and laborers, unrecognized and unhonored. He was as faithfully fulfilling his mission while working at his humble trade as when he healed the sick or walked upon the storm-tossed waves of Galilee. So in the humblest duties and lowliest positions of life, we may walk and work with Jesus. The Apostle says, Let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 24. The businessman may conduct his business in a way that will glorify his master because of his fidelity. If he is a true follower of Christ, he will carry his religion into everything that is done and reveal to men the Spirit of Christ. The mechanic may be a diligent and faithful representative of him who toiled in the lowly walks of life among the hills of Galilee. 
Everyone who names the name of Christ should so work that others, by seeing his good works, may be led to glorify their Creator and Redeemer. Many have excused themselves from rendering their gifts to the service of Christ because others were possessed of superior endowments and advantages. The opinion has prevailed that only those who are especially talented are required to consecrate their abilities to the service of God. It has come to be understood by many that talents are given to only a certain favored class, to the exclusion of others who, of course, are not called upon to share in the toils or the rewards. But it is not so represented in the parable. When the master of the house called his servants, he gave to every man his work. With a loving spirit, we may perform life's humblest duties as to the Lord. Colossians 3, verse 23. If the love of God is in the heart, it will be manifested in the life. The sweet savor of Christ will surround us, and our influence will elevate and bless. You are not to wait for great occasions or to expect extraordinary abilities before you go to work for God. You need not have a thought of what the world will think of you. If your daily life is a testimony to the purity and sincerity of your faith— and others are convinced that you desire to benefit them, your efforts will not be wholly lost. The humblest and poorest of the disciples of Jesus can be a blessing to others. They may not realize that they are doing any special good, but by their unconscious influence, they may start waves of blessing that will widen and deepen, and the blessed results they may never know until the day of final reward. They do not feel or know that they are doing anything great. They are not required to weary themselves with anxiety about success. They have only to go forward quietly, doing faithfully the work that God's providence assigns, and their life will not be in vain. Their own souls will be growing more and more into the likeness of Christ. They are workers together with God in this life and are thus fitting for the higher work and the unshadowed joy of the life to come.